I think the main question of this panel is whether European integration is helping and supporting convergence in this post-crisis situation in the actual structure of European integration. Now, um, the lessons prove that EU was slow, late and weak in reacting uh, to the uh, uh, sovereign debt crisis starting with uh, 2008 and step by step uh, came to some decisions. Today we have a, a very good program towards a genuine uh, economic and monetary union for the next 10 years, more and more documents, the six pack uh, and so on. However, after the crisis, we are more divided than before, and Lucas already addressed this problem. Uh, I um, noted on my um, paper much before that um, there is a split within the Eurozone between more and less performing, more and less uh, disciplined uh, countries. There is a growing gap between ins and outs because we have strengthened the conditionality of accessing to, uh, to the euro, and there is a visible division within the outs because some countries are still targeting the euro and some others are distancing themselves from such an objective. So uh, we are a um, victim of a multiple uh, uh, division. However, crises are useful. Crises are useful because they highlight the weak points of a system and they may give some starting uh, uh, energy. Uh, the question is whether we are at a turning point now. Uh, the year 2014 looks like that. Uh, we have just uh, approved the new multi-annual financial framework, so we have got a budget for the next seven years. Uh, we are uh, looking forward to the renewal of two main institutions of the EU, European parliamentary elections by the end of May, uh, then uh, a new commission will uh, take office. And uh, in that perspective, we try to, uh, to measure the uh, impact and the lessons of the last big enlargement, the 10 years, which inspires for a, uh, at least 10 year forecast. Uh, now the question is how we are going to approach the main challenges of the EU. There is one main challenge, uh, of course, the, the post-Euro crisis competitiveness of the EU. Let's forget about that unfortunate initial uh, Lisbon strategy, which uh, set some dreams on the horizon being the most performant knowledge-based uh, or more competitive knowledge-based economy. Uh, we are beyond that. But what would be the real approach, uh, uh, whether we can maintain this market-based uh, liberal model uh, of integration, or we have to add some new elements? Another question which is floating around in the air uh, is the post-Lisbon integration perspectives, whether a new convention uh, should be convoked, whether uh, we have enough engagement for any kind of a treaty modification, or we have to turn around within the limits of the actual uh, treaties. Then, uh, of course, enlargement was a uh, an interesting problem uh, this morning, we starting with the Eastern Partnership and then going down to the Western Balkans, a neighborhood policy which used to be the most efficient foreign policy uh, branch of the European uh, uh, common thinking. Today we see that uh, real perspectives are, for Serbia and Montenegro for sure, they are going ahead. And in a few years, we may have an EU of 30 members, not more. Not more because the rest of the Western Balkans is a shrinking enclave with very specific problems for each of the residual countries. Uh, we could find some solution combining individual with collective uh, rapprochement. Turkey is a pending issue, a negotiation 
since nine years is not a good thing in politics. Uh, this half open situation, it's like a very long uh, engagement, very long fiancé. It's not good to be a fiancé forever. Uh, there should be some action uh, sooner or later. And uh, the Eastern Partnership is a clear failure, at least for three reasons. Uh, I think uh, the EU has overestimated its own attraction in the next zone of enlargement. We somehow projected uh, the situation of the last big enlargement where there was no alternative to European integration in Warsaw, Budapest or Bucharest. There was a very clear choice in favor of Europe by then. Uh, in Kiev, the situation is different. Uh, in Baku, the situation is different. And uh, as it uh, uh, has been proved in Yerevan, they have another choice. Why? Because there is another pool of attraction very near. And they have to decide between two. This is not a single uh, decision. Um, the second uh, failure of that strategy was that we uh, somehow neglected uh, the presence of Russia. The press wrote after this uh, non-signature of the Ukrainian Association treaty that there is an elephant in the room, whether we like to see it or not, but the elephant is there. And the elephant is there, and we have to calculate with the reactions of the ele elephant, which was somehow excluded like a white spot from the whole thinking of the um, Eastern Partnership thinking. And uh, one old habit of the European Union, here again we applied a six-pack approach, putting together six countries in the same basket, six very different countries, starting with Belarus, which was a non-starter for any relationship with the EU, uh, Azerbaijan, which is a lonely rider, Armenia, which changed camp in the meantime. What, what remained? Two brave countries, Georgia and Moldova, in favor of Europe. And the rest is highly uncertain for the time being. So um, we should think about the future because it is not good not to know, at least for the next budgetary period going until 2020, how many are we at all? At what time? Uh, it would be good for us, and it would be good for the, uh, the candidates. And finally, EU institutions. I am really glad to meet Danuta today. We meet rather rarely. Uh, it reminds me, 10 years ago, if you remember, Danuta, there was a, we, we were, yeah, but the moment I, I am just recalling uh, uh, we were after our hearings, very first hearings at the European Parliament as first commissioners, and we didn't take office yet. And then Romano Prodi was offering a dinner for the 10 new commissioners. And uh, I remember the time we were walking side by side with you on the stairs uh, up to the private uh, dining room of, of uh, the president of the commission, we had Sim Kallas, who is still there. We had uh, Daria Gribauskaita. She is today the president of Lithuania. So the first team. And this was a breathtaking moment. This was the moment when we really felt uh, being insiders, not out the EU, but being uh, in a top institution. By then, the selection of the commissioners was a public affair in the new member states. It was an open procedure which is not the case anymore, which is not the case anymore, and people are curious to know how on earth they find the commissioners, because nobody is requesting a democratic procedure from the member state. They just send a name to the uh, new uh, head of uh, the commission. In addition, uh, the work of commissioners, and I may say that because I used to be one of them, is not sanctioned by electoral decisions, not directly. Commissioners are there for five years, and uh, I have some uh, uh, thoughts about those five years because uh, uh, this is more than any government uh, in the member states. I don't think that this is a good decision to have a commissioner for a longer time 
than national executives. It should be either equal or less than that time, in my perception. Uh, and then we come to the European Parliament. Here again, people will see that we are voting not for persons, we are voting for party sympathies in most member states. And party headquarters are deciding who is on the list, on what place. Uh, it doesn't depend from the, the citizens. It depends from some mysterious internal political kitchens. Here again, five years without any any political risk. Uh, we are dying daily in national parliaments in the fight uh, before uh, the opposition, uh, before the, 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 the press, the public opinion. And the, in the European Parliament, with all due respect to uh, uh, the members of the European Parliament, one of them is uh, with us, but uh, uh, the noble mission is not under democratic control. So this, uh, and some may misuse uh, uh, that uh, situation. Um, on Monday, we will have the very first debate in the European Parliament between two uh, candidates for the position of the, uh, the President of the European Commission. Uh, this is the first attempt of the Parliament. Very good. So we will see the reactions of the heads of government, whether they like this approach, because this is not uh, uh, regulated in the Lisbon Treaty, but this is a, a good, good start. Um, and then, uh, with a new parliament, with a new budget, we can be hopeful that uh, we will have the means for a real convergence. We have money in the EU budget, but we have learned some lessons that that money is not always sufficient. This is a necessary but not sufficient condition of conver convergence because we would need national development plans. Not all the member states do have such plans. Some uh, expect uh, advice from the European Commission, but the European Commission cannot overtake the role of national governments and national strategic planning. We would need good management in the member states we would need very clear public procurements, impartial uh, uh, allocation of that money, good quality of institutions, short democracy, and really functioning market economies, which is not always the case. Um, some people are afraid that Eurosceptic uh, parties are coming up in the various member states. This is a fact. This is maybe the... Uh, impact of the crisis. Uh, but I don't think they would ever challenge the position of the two big parties, the European People's Party and the, the, the Social, Social Democratic family. They may challenge the position of the Greens, perhaps, but uh, uh, even so, they are not always open to each other. What is more uh, interesting, and this is the end of my uh, very short uh, contribution, is uh, the model crisis. The model crisis because we have a provision in the treaty about an ever closer union. And the ever closer union is not an exclusive strategy for all of us anymore. There are at least three alternatives voiced not by Eurosceptic uh, people shouting lo loudly in the European Parliament, but by governments. But by governments. One is a standstill. The EU is good as it is, let's not deepen integration anymore. The second one is a regression. Let's give powers back to the member states. Let's reduce the competencies of the EU. Uh, and the third one is a kind of a peripheral strategy, balancing on the very edge of the EU, taking its money, but refusing its values and rules. For the first two, we have examples like the UK, the famous Cameron speech. For the third one, mainly Hungary is a champion uh, nowadays, balancing like dancing on a rope that money is good but rules uh, are not for us. Um, we had a very interesting situation uh, that until the day of accession, there was a pro-European elite leading the country, never mind the 
party colors, starting with Josef Antal, the first democratically elected prime minister, through Gyula Horn, the socialist leader, and so on, until the day of accession, 10 years ago. And since then, there is a, a clear decline uh, contesting the model of European modernization, which is very similar to the Russian doctrine, uh, a false perception of history, of power relations, uh, 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 an exclusive interpretation uh, of many rules, internationally accepted rules, the EU could prevent such a distortion in the uh, EU if we are insisting on conditionality, not only on how to spend EU money, but uh, at a higher level, uh, at the level of accession, as it used to be with the Copenhagen criteria. Thank you. Thank you.